Our next reader is uh, Edward Viduri, and uh, he's a Bukowski man. That's one way to say it. He's got some amazing uh, poetry, Ramona and Rumi, Love in the Time of Oligarchy and Unedited Necessary Poems. I just messed it up. No, I got that right. Okay. That's Hercules Press this last year. He's the director of operations of the 2018 uh, for the Valley International Poetry Festival in McAllen. He is the poet laureate of McAllen. Edward, the turn, my friend. today for this, but I, um, I want to read the introduction to P.W.'s book, The Motor Hotels of Central Avenue. He gave me this manuscript so that I could uh, write the intro to it, and it's like, how do you write an intro? So um, around the same time, um, Rob, Rob Johnson, beat scholar down in, in the valley, um, he let me borrow a book called The Gage Letters written by William Burroughs, letters that he wrote to Allen Ginsberg. And I really liked the style, and, I, and I, I was just talking about that before I read that, about how we don't write enough letters to each other, and, and how important they, they're so honest and, and, and raw, and how we've lost that art of letter writing through social media. Now we just answer each other through memes and emojis and, and just short sentences. And so when he told me about this, I said, <clears throat> I'm gonna write P.W. a letter. So this is uh, dated November 2017, uh, P.W. Covington, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Dear P.W., I gave a 27-year-old woman a ride to Far Texas today. She was waiting in the rain with her beat toddler in, in arms. She had a backpack strapped to her back, a large blanket for the child, who was already fussy and raining hell in her ears. She looked, so beat and beautiful, so blessed, so magic. We were both dropping our kids off at school, so when I asked her if she needed a ride, she said yes. When I crossed 10th Street, I thought of your words, and what of her, and what of truth. Her story, she ran her mother over accidentally, broke every bone in her hand. Her husband can't return home to her and the kids until he gets off the drugs. She smiles at me with a suffering surge of hope in her eyes down to her ocean in hopes. I tell you, P.W., I admire a good struggle. Your book was a soundtrack this morning in transit through rain and the Texas humidity, and with the ghost bike reminding me of the crosses in the barkage. A drive to H-E-B, why not? I have been carrying your manuscript with me everywhere. I spill coffee on noon, one of my favorite poems in it. I can hear your voice read it to me. Very few have the gift of sounding good live and looking good on paper. You do both throughout the motor hotels of Central Avenue. Not from here or there, but from everywhere. Plumbing through your travels, leaving seeds of poetry as you distance yourself from that cage. You are free, man. Your book is alive. Depending on where my heart and mind are at the time, there's a poem that speaks to me. And no poems block out other poems. Each one is well con concocted which reminds me that we still have to have an absent-inspired workshop. The Green Ferry in New Mexico? Last night at work, all the TVs went AWOL, messages across all of them. This only happens when the weather is bad. I walked outside and the only thing that stuck was the humidity. There was a stillness, an eeriness to it all. And again, I returned to a poem, the Stratosphere Hotel. Poems die when they do not mean to sway or swing and negotiate multiple realities of me, then it fucking rained. Vicariously through you, I am at Standing Rock through shores of the cannonball, peering in on the deputies and armed vigilantes, but most importantly, watching the elders and medicine women. Elders and medicine women dance tonight, water protectors in small firelights, sing songs that never ended across the cannonball meaning Nikoni. It's about so much more than the water, it's, but it's about the water first, meaning Nikoni. Your poems put you right there to suffer and fight alongside those going through injustice. 
I think of the words of Gloria Ian Tardua in her poem, The New Speaker. Words are our trade. We speak them soft. We speak them hard. We are our age's mouthpieces. I thank you for your poetry. I am happy you're prolific. I love that you travel and fight the good fight. I am honored to be your friend. Now go write that collection of short fiction, your brother in poetry, Hidaura. <laughs> And, you know, I was thinking of the right things to say because I got a lot of shit for this panel on Facebook about why it was uh, only males, only men in the panel. And, I mean, we talked about how the panel just came about. Um, and, it, you know, made me question also things about, you know, when we're connected or being told you want to be part of a panel. I guess the questions could be something like, are there women in the panel? I go where I'm invited. I guess that's my, you know, you know, fault there. You know, <laughs> no, but I go where I'm, I'm invited, and you know, I got a lot of things, you know, shit for it, and and you know, I, you know, I was like, okay, I'll give it to me. You know, I'll give, you know, if I did some wrong, I'll take it. You know, and I'll learn from it. Um, so you know, the poet in me looks for inspiration through the arts of others. Just as we write about good and evil, um, I chose Bukowski as an early um, inspiration because of his simplicity, and you know what I need, what I grew up around. You know, I grew up around Bukowski-ish people. You know, I don't love or loathe him. Um, I'm simply a watcher and word catcher. Um, and he reminded me of an uncle, and he reminded me of a lot of bad choices my mother made growing when I was growing up. You know, in men. And so I was surrounded by the Bukowskis, you know. And so when I read his poetry, it just, you know, triggered that, that you know, that life that I had lived. So um, this is a, a poem that I wrote in, in 2012 titled, What Would Bukowski Do? And it's, to, it's, it's inspired by reading Bukowski's, you know, I was engulfing myself in, in, in Bukowski because of his simplicity. Um, before, you know, I was woke to a lot of the misogynistic, you know, things that, that were in his writing. So, where is he? It's called A Bukowski Day. <laughs> I opened the fridge to look for a cold drink. I saw an energy drink and asked myself, what would Bukowski do? So I grabbed the first beer I could get my hands on. I brought the typewriter outside, and again, what would Bukowski do? I lit a cigarette and decided that I must leave the house ready for when my wife returns. The sun is out and it's fucking hot, humid, birds are chirping, my guess they're hot too. My dog seconds ago eagerly ran out the door, now panting and itching to get back in. What would Bukowski do? I open the door and kick him in with a growl. There's a t-ball set on the lawn and a warped pool from last summer. My wife will come home to a mess of papers on the floor and she will ask, what did you do all day? What would Bukowski say? I smoked cigarettes, drank beer, wrestled with the dog, and wrote a few poems. <laughs> So my new book, Ramon and Rumi, Love in the Time of Oligarchy, has nothing to do with Bukowski or Burroughs. Um, but the unedited necessary poems part of it is very Bukowski uh, inspired. I tried and I, and I challenged myself to write love poems while listening to heavy metal, which is not music I listen to. So uh, this one is titled Just Us Three. And this was from, um, a song by Civic called The Space for This. Song starts off carefully, you know, like a menage a trois, then all hell breaks loose. We fold in, we fold into each other, six legs and six hands, three mouths destroying the blues in the air. The night table trembles and the champagne flute sings. We can't afford another broken bed, so we lay in our sweat and moans nursing our rug burns. Are there 
This one's uh, inspired by a uh, disturbed song, Down With the Sickness. There's a frame in my home with a close-up with a close-up uh, photograph still of a strawberry. Everyone looks at it when they visit our home. It's on the dresser against the mirror and the several stones and sage that lay on a ceramic artisan made bowl I bought for $15 at the local art walk in town several years ago. The first time I saw the strawberry, I was holding my penis over the toilet to piss. I thought, man, whose pussy is that? So I called it the frame. That night, she asked me if I liked the strawberry photo and laughed. I said, oh, the frame? Yeah, I don't know how I feel about a vagina staring at me piss. She said, don't be dumb. I thought it was so artsy for a restroom, I guess I said. The next day, the frame was in the bedroom. She said, do you like where I put it now? I said, sure. I love being surrounded by things I love. The frame has moved around the home many times. I've thought of pinning it to the ceiling. I thought of writing a series of poems about it. Last night we kissed and let our hands work their way under the sheets, and I could have sworn I heard her say, eat away at my frame. <laughs> This one's inspired by Mar Marilyn Manson's song, Third Day of a Seven Day Binge. It's one of my favorite songs, it fucking jams. You gotta listen to it. The screaming, neighbor waking, police calling, cat crying, dog howling, bed breaking, skin sweating, thrusting, pushing, pulling, sucking, fucking love. The bad things, dying flowers, misery, silent, bright things, the hallucinations, the stars in the sky, the moon, the drugs, the drugs, the drugs, love, the way you pour coffee while floating, the way you walk away, turn around and tease, the way you wear me out. I don't think my wife's read these poems. <laughs> I have one called Wet Pam Girl. That's why I know she hasn't read it. <laughs> this was titled Mouth Song, inspired by Nine Inch Nails' song, The Hand That Feeds. I wrote this poem in a dream state. I think of your hands, the slowness in your movements. When you look into the mirror and undress, you slide into the bath, new beauty relaxing. I imagine you have a favorite song that gives you chills. Excuse me. Sing it to me. Sing it into my mouth. I think of your legs, how you lather them in apricot gel lifting your foot above you, closing your eyes, humming a tune, a distant love song only angels can hear. Hum it on me, hum it into my ear. I think of your tongue, how it traces the island around your lips, destroying yesterday's promises. You speak in whispers underwater, naming a century's worth of hurricanes. Lay it on me. Lay it on my tongue. I have a book called Charles Bukowski on love. And I've read them all, and I think the last poem in here is like one of his most beautiful poems when it comes to love, especially after everything he's written. And it's not a long poem, it's a very short one, and it's titled Confessions. Waiting for death like a cat that will jump on the bed. I am so very sorry for my wife. She will see this stiff white body, shake it once, then maybe again. Hank, 
Hank won't answer. It's not my death that worries me. It's my wife left with this pile of nothing. I want to let her know, though, that all the nights sleeping beside her, even the useless arguments, were things ever splendid. And the hard words I ever feared to say can now be said, I love you. Thank you. I didn't read you the poem that I wrote. I want to believe it was him. I got lost at Hollywood Park in 1982, the day, oddly enough, won by a nose with the help of a whip and a Mexican jockey, with seeking the soul in second. I was holding hands with an old man whose face, hair, body, and teeth had stay away from me written all over it. <coughs> Fuck you, death! Fuck you to death, city of light! He yelled at the track. The losing tickets were confetted into the air by all. Only some ran to the ticket booth, uh, others to the concession for more beer. Then he said, come on, kid, let's go look for your father. I said, I came with my mother, my other mother. What's that you say, he growled and burped. My other mother, she brought me, she always brings me and she always wins. She has a system. He looked at me and put a cigarette to his lips, inhaled, then exhaled. What's your other mother look like, he asked. Like a man, I said. My mother saw us and grabbed my hand. The old man looked at her and said, he's a smart kid. We walked away. He flagged down the valet who drove up in a BMW. The old man got in his car and drove away. The ticket on the floor crumbled up like his cheeks red, $40 bet. I thought, even rich men walk away sometimes, a loser. <laughs> There's a bluebird on the border on the Mexican side, and they don't let him fly to me. He sings to the merchants on the streets, but they don't recognize her song. Her, I'm sorry. She sings to the merchants on the streets, but they don't recognize her song. The kid playing the accordion, the taco vendors, the shoe shiners, they don't let her sing. They pour tequila down her throat. There's a bluebird at the border, and I call out for her to fly over the wall, but they won't let her. She's sad, and her song is fading, but I yell through the teeth of metal hate for her to be brave. That even though there's a wall that separates us, she's in my heart. <laughs> 